once told a story about a family. In the family, there were a father and two sons. The father was a farmer, a landowner. He was one who had employed, at least on a volunteer basis, his sons to work the farm. Well, the younger son, as you might imagine, was the independent one, even a bit rebellious. Some looked at him at times and thought he was a little greedy, maybe even a tad bit arrogant. And the younger son decided one day that he was going to go to his father. So he goes to his father and he says, I went out of this town. I am ready to live on my own and I need money. Now maybe those of us who have children who are 17 or 18 or 19 years old have heard those words before. So the younger son says to his father that he wants his share of his father's inheritance. That would have been a portion of the family's land holdings. So not only in this moment does the younger son reject the family's solidarity, <coughs> He's also demanding an inheritance from his father before his father has even died. And that is a huge insult to dad. So far now in this story, the older son is being rather silent. He keeps working. He's tending the farm, caring for the crops, caring for the livestock, and working with his father. <coughs> Surprisingly in all of this, the father does not exercise his parental authority by demanding that his younger son give up these plans and wild ideas. And he gives the younger son the inheritance. Well, after presumably selling the land and getting the money for it, the young son gets out of town. He leaves home, he heads off for the greener grass of anywhere else, and uses the money to do what some would call a disgraceful lifestyle. In short, in this time, the son manages to turn his back on his family, leave the familiarity of his home setting, and lose sight of his religion all at the same time. It's fun. He's enjoying a time of free and fun living, and all of a sudden things kind of go from bad to worse. And the son finds himself broke, jobless, hungry, and a very long way from home. If that's not enough, then the crisis hits. A famine in the town where this young son is living. The drought has dried up all the crops. People are hungry. And because he has used up all of his money having fun, he had no resources available to help him survive the famine. So he thinks to himself, and he figures out that in order to survive, he is going to humiliate himself by working for the Gentiles as a swine herd. Now it's bad enough for a teenager to be cleaning up after the pigs. But you know, pigs were not kosher. They were considered unclean by the religious community. No good Palestinian would be caught anywhere near a pig. So this young man is in dire straits. He even tried satisfying his own hunger with the food he gave to the pigs. And it didn't work. The son then believed that the only way he was really going to survive was to return to his father's house as a hired hand. Here comes those young adult children back home. <laughs> He knew, though, that he could not reclaim his status as a son, so he better ask for a job. Now back to the family farm. The 
actions of the father were most unexpected. Usually, a father who has been so shamed by the actions of his son would have disowned that son by now. But here we have a father who's been waiting for his son's return. And as soon as he saw that son coming down the lane up to the farm, he ran out to meet him. Something a Palestinian Jewish patriarch would never have done. It was most out of character. Here we have a father who has been publicly shamed by the actions of his son. A father who is reaching out to him, welcoming home, welcoming him home, kissing him, giving him a robe and a ring, and planning a party to welcome him home. Now this party was actually pretty necessary because the son had caused a bit of damage with the neighbors. The neighbors would have regarded his behavior as undermining the traditional values and setting a really terrible example. So the party was to help ease the son back into the good graces of his neighbors. Re-enter the older son. While the party was going on, he shows up. He is filled with all kinds of feelings, mostly jealousy and resentment. He is just mad. Here comes the father again. Just as this father reached out to his young son who was lost, so now he is reaching out to the elder son who was in danger really of becoming just as lost as his brother. Another very surprising move by the father. You see, the father leaves all the guests, just abandons them, which was clearly a breach of etiquette. And he goes to his older son to persuade him to rejoice at his younger brother's return. In typical fashion, the story ends right there. We don't know what happens next. Jesus doesn't tell us if the elder son even came to the party. But what we do know is the extraordinary love of the Father that brought reconciliation to the family. The reconciliation between the Father and the young son did not occur because of what the son did, but because of what the Father did. Both the son and the Father acted Contrary to the expectation of the day, the young sons going off and flaunting of convention and traditional ways served his selfish purposes. And the father's behavior in dealing with all of the sorrow and shame of having been treated so disrespectfully by his son made it possible for the reconciliation to happen. This story is one that points to God's deep desire and greatest yearning and passionate dream for all of God's children and the whole of creation. As children of God, we are made by God to be in loving relationship and harmony and communion with God and with each other and with all of creation. And yet, we all know that we as humans have those times in our lives when we feel lost, where we have separated ourselves away from God and the love of Jesus. God reaches out to us, sometimes before we know it, sometimes before we realize it. 
God reaches out to us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. God reaches out to us with the promise of new life and hope. God reaches out to us through the compassion and care of people in our lives. God unites us with all of God's children through the grace and love of Jesus. In Christ, we are reconciled to God. As the scripture says, for anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. This transformation that alters our standards of judgment is nothing other than a new creation, a new order of existence. The Apostle Paul's favorite way to express this new reality is simply to say that we are in Christ. In Christ. This new creation in Christ relegates to the past the old things like class and prejudice and stereotypes and misconceptions and all the other judgments that we carry around. Those old standards like race and social status and wealth and prestige and title and you can name it all and on like I can are not part of the new experience in Christ. If the love of Christ controls us, guides us, leads us, then we are free to be open and accepting of others on the basis of seeing them through the eyes of Christ, the one who gave himself for everyone. Our transformation is ongoing and continuing and ongoing and continuing as part of our spiritual journey. The old things became old, and suddenly the new surrounds us. In Christ, we are fully free to experience this love and grace and create a new humanity. Our response to the vision of God to bring creation home. Again, the scripture continues saying, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. The word reconcile basically means to make otherwise, or to alter. And interestingly, the word is used in the New Testament only by the Apostle Paul. He uses it to describe the relation between God and and all of us, the word reconcile is used only in God's direction. We ourselves are the ones who become reconciled to God. God takes the initiative and we are invited to be transformed and to come home. In Christ, it is possible. It may sound like a tall order to think about being transformed and creating a new humanity. But it is possible for each and every one of us to experience a new relationship with God based upon trust and love. And what happens inside of us becomes possible to share with others. So this transformative new life is what we are asked to become as a visible expression of a new reality for our world. 
The ministry of reconciliation awakens us to God's love in us so that our lives may proclaim it. While we indeed are the recipients of God's gracious love, we also become the agents of God's love to share with others. One example of this is the day we celebrate today, called One Great Hour of Sharing. It's a day when we join with Christians around the world to unite together in reaching out with the love that God has given us. We unite in reaching out like that loving father to those who experience the crises of natural disaster or illness or tragedy, who find themselves hungry and homeless and without that which has been their normal life. We offer ourselves in so many ways through our monetary gifts and our prayers and our outreach through our mission and service. Sometimes it's as small as a mosquito net. Sometimes it's as large as transforming an entire culture and community. Sometimes it's the gift of education. Sometimes it's medical care. Whatever it is, this is one example of a ministry of offering to the world that which Christ has given to us. New life, hope, reconciliation of heart and spirit. This good news that we have received is not ours to hoard. It is ours to share, to give away, to offer to someone who can use that word of hope. God's love in Christ is a forever invitation to respond to such grace with our faith and our faithfulness. And so today, this day in Lent, this day of sleepiness, this day of looking ahead to a new week, this day, whatever this day brings for you, let us receive a warm invitation to be the new creation through the love and grace of God in Christ.